Hopefully everybody is uh, well caffeinated. So I'd like to, uh, like to continue this conversation about art direction for the web. Um, and um, this time I'm going to delve a little bit more deeply into, uh, into some code. Nothing too technical. Nothing which is going to make the designers in the room run away. Um, I'm glad everybody is still here. I noticed one or two exceptions, but uh, that means that I will, um, I will take the piss out of them mercilessly when they come back for being late. Okay, so I've got to admit that a few years ago, I completely lost my interest in web design. Um, looking at the web did not improve my motivation. I thought that web design had become very stagnant, that making things predictable um, had replaced creativity, um, and that somehow uh, ideas seemed less important than data or research or testing or any of these other horribly boring things. So, uh, oh, let me, um, that's a mistake. Let me change that title. There we go. Thank you for that. We know this isn't going to end well. Just like when Jerry Halliwell left the Spice Girls. Now, when I began working with a, a legendary uh, newspaper and magazine designer, Mark Porter, I became fascinated by art direction um, and editorial design. And as somebody that, um, oh, welcome back. <laughs> Round of applause, everybody. <laughs> thank, you, uh, thank you for the coffee. That's, that's, that's lovely, thank you. Um, oh, t oh, tea. Now, I didn't study um, either of those things at art school, so everything about this new area to me was, was exciting, and it was new. Um, and the more I became inspired by magazine and editorial design, somehow the, the faster that my enthusiasm for web design came back. And I just wonder sometimes why. So many web designers think that you know, print design is old-fashioned somehow and it's not relevant to their work because that's wrong. So what I do now is I buy new magazines as often as I could, uh, as often as I can. In fact, I was actually thinking the other day, you know, going back five years, the bookcase in my studio was pretty much all web code. You know, it was all books about HTML and CSS, and I think there was still a copy of Dynamic HTML Magic still knocking around. Um, or the, um, the complete Bible of, of, uh, of CSS that I'm sure you've now got holding up your monitor. Um, now, all of my books are all design-related. Um, some of them are so big they won't fit on the bookcase. I bought a book about logo design recently. It's so big a small family can live underneath it. <laughs> it's all good fun. So, a week or so before Christmas last year, I was uh, meeting up with some friends in London, and we stopped in at Magma, which is one of my favorite magazine shops. And I was explaining to my friends why I found magazine design so inspiring and how they've been influencing my work. And that conversation inspired the idea for making a, a series of inspired design decisions articles. So every month um, on Smashing Magazine, I, I choose an art director or a designer or a, a magazine and then discuss what makes that design distinctive and interesting, how we might learn lessons um, from it, and then we can apply those lessons to the web. So I'm very happy to say, you can probably tell by now, Brexit aside, I am inspired. 
and um, motivated again. I'm quite a happy bloke. Um, and I really hope that this series can, you know, inspire other people too. So I've got loads of magazines that are kind of laying around my studio. The, the collection is still growing. Um, and uh, I picked up a copy of this, Pressing Matters, which was uh, a magazine about printmaking. And I was immediately transported back to art school where my fingers were always, always covered in cuts from lino and, and woodcuts. I smelt like oil and turpentine and paint the whole time. And this is, I love this magazine, not just for the content, but for the style. It's got this distinctive, very simple style. It uses a, a limited color palette, which often connects the color of headlines and other typographic elements with colors that are in nearby photos and prints. And this makes a design which feels really connected. Now, you can't tell me that those things are not important and useful in web design too, because they are. Now, Pressing Matters uses uh, layout patterns, which also produce this rhythm which flows right the way through the magazine. They use differently sized grid modules, which speed you up through pages that are packed with prints, and then um, the pace really slows down um, so that you linger over these large pieces of artwork. Again, incredibly important to user experience or a customer journey. And what struck me about this magazine in particular was how it includes this variety of layout styles, um, but it still allows for a wide variety of content, just like a website. Um, and it still maintains this high degree of consistency, which is just as important on a website. And, you know, a lot of people still recite this mantra that the web isn't print. But, you know, there's so much that we can learn which is going to make our web designs better. You know, when I look at... Um, how these pages are constructed, I actually discovered that it's a layered compound grid of two and three columns, which is used right the way throughout the magazine. And a compound grid is a layout tool which was made famous by Carl Gerstner. So Gerstner was a, a Swiss artist and one of the most influential typographers, and books about his work have been out of print for decades. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't seen anything of his work firsthand. But by strange coincidence, um, when I was researching this, uh, this talk, I actually discovered that Gerstner's agency um, actually created ads um, in the 1960s for... Um, 1950s, I think, for, um, for Sina, which is a, a Swiss large format camera company that I actually worked for in the 1990s. Funny how this thing works out. So, compound grids. Gerstner was one of the first designers to exploit the creative flexibility of using grids. And this compound grid, which he designed for Capital magazine has become one of his most well-known creations. And given the variety of content in Capital, Gerstner needed this grid that would help him lay out content consistently without any kind of restrictions. And he called it a mobile grid, although it's not the sort of mobile that, that we're used to. And this image is probably what you'll find um, if you do a Google search for compound grid. Confused? I certainly was. So, it looks incredibly complex. So, in order to explain how and why he created it um, and how you can use it or something similar, I'm going to break it down into its parts. 
there are actually four, uh, 58 um, columns and rows in this grid. Gerstner started off with just the one, so um, content in this single module just fills the entire width of a page. And then he divided that single module into two columns and two rows, and this results in a reassuring um, symmetrical design. And it can then be subdivided into three columns and rows, and if you notice the um, the gutter widths between all of these divisions in the grid are always the same size. And then by splitting that module into four, the columns of content feel a lot more formal. And the overall impression from the design is something which is more serious. And then when the full page is divided into five columns and maybe separated by what's called a, um, in, into spatial zones by what's called a flow line, this design starts to feel a lot more technical. And with Gerstner's grid, you can use each set of columns and rows separately. You can turn them into a compound grid by either overlaying the grids or by stacking them one on top of the other. So dividing the page into six columns, um, six rows of modules creates just this incredible um, variety of layout options. And the flexibility of a compound grid comes from this interplay of two or more grids and how that affects the position and size of elements that you put on it. So a compound grid simply is two or more grids um, of any type. So they can be column grids, they can be modular, they can be symmetrical or asymmetrical, and they can be used on one page. And they can occupy separate areas, or you can overlap them. So if you're still not really sure about how modular grids, um, compound grids, uh, using them as Gerstner did, I'm going to start by uh, overlapping two column grids. One's got two columns, one's got three. And by using any number of equally sized columns and rows, these layouts uh, form this consistent pattern. There's an even rhythm which doesn't change across the page. Sadly, the contrast on these slides is not showing you the actual grid lines. So I will make sure that the slides are up um, online somewhere after the talk. Sorry about that. The contrast is not great on this projector or on my slides. Another design faux pas. Now, most designs like this one over on the left-hand side, um, the starting point for most designers is you open up Sketch or Photoshop or something and you might go to view the grid and what do you get? You get 12 even columns. Or, if you're feeling particularly daring today, you might, um, even if you're not using Bootstrap, you probably use Bootstrap's 12 column grid as well. Um, but if you think about the, the pattern of those columns, um, as a rhythm, and you tap out 12 even columns on the desk. Not very inspiring. Sounds like a piece of German marching band music. <gasps> Where am I again? <laughs> now, if you compare that with the rhythm that you get from a compound grid. I'm going to go back a slide so that you can see it. What we have is a rhythm of two, one, one, two. Two, one, one, two. Much, much more interesting. Um, and I'd, I'd like you to start thinking about layout patterns as rhythmic patterns, and it makes a lot more sense. Um, Brings these, um, brings these techniques to life. So a compound grid of two and three columns um, makes a, this rhythmic pattern of two, one, one, two. Um, and then for an altogether different design, you know, which maybe uses italic type to 
suggest the, the movement of this Jaguar E-Type car, which is, of course, the most beautiful car ever made, without any doubt. Um, or I can stagger the start of that stand first initial paragraph um, and the running text um, using lines which come from both grids. And then changing the formation um, to combine three and four columns creates a totally different rhythmic pattern. It's three, one, two, two, one, three. And you can use widths from one grid or another, or you can combine widths from both grids to form um, columns which don't conform to either grid. And that same combination of grids can make for a very different impression. Um, this column matches um, the large vertical image over on the, the left-hand side of the design. And this time I'm going to set that running text across two columns and their widths are derived from combining units from four and three column grids. If you overlay four columns and five, you get a very um, unusual rhythmic pattern, six, one, four, three, three, four, one, six. Um, and in this version of the design, this large image shows off the iconic um, shape of the body of the E-type, and then the, uh, it almost fills the width of the page. Um, and then this solid block of running text sits right underneath the wheels. And that column gets its widths from both the four and the six column grids. And this design literally puts the E-type at the center of the action. It wraps text around both sides, which adds energy and movement to the design. And it's this combination of six and four column grids that I tend to use most option because uh, you know, they're flexible enough to handle many different types of content. Now, I mostly use FR units um, to specify the patterns for the compound grids. So, for example, um, the result of a two plus three column uh, compound grid is four columns, and the width of the outer columns occupies twice the space of the inner columns. And a combination of three and four column grids gives us a result of six columns, this different rhythmic pattern. Or four and five gives us six columns and a different rhythmic pattern again. And then finally, four and six columns gives us eight columns, with two of them much, much narrower than the rest. And this is a rhythmic pattern in CSS of two FR, 1FR, 1FR, 2FR, 2FR, 1FR, 1FR, 2FR. And FR units are your friend, particularly when um, working with compound grids. So it might seem quite complex, but it's actually no more difficult to implement than any other 8 or, in fact, 12 column grid. All I need to implement that design is this ridiculously few HTML elements, no presentational markup at all, and then the CSS is even more compact, and it's a lot more stable than other layout tools. I want to talk about Alexei Brodovich. Um, I became fascinated by editorial and magazine design, and his name kept coming up, and I was really drawn to the uh, precision in his work, particularly the way that he brought photographs and text together in some incredible ways, ways that we just don't see online, and I couldn't really think of a reason why not. I also really appreciate his kind of rebellious um, rejection of anything that he really considered to be um, mediocre. Um, he was born in what today is Belarus, um, and then he moved to Paris where he beat uh, Pablo Picasso in a poster competition. Um, and then he moved to the US to uh, teach design. And he used to tell his students to astonish me. I love this. Now, autonomous art 
which was driven much more by subconscious. Uh, painters like Kandinsky and Miro, they suppressed um, conscious thought in the painting process. Whereas a constructivist movement sought to consciously and very deliberately construct art, which seems to me to be very relevant to what we do online. And this meant placing deliberately lines and shapes using geometry. And the results were incredibly striking, which is why constructivism uh, was often used in political art and in propaganda. Um, constructivism is really a, um, a, a major influence on um, particularly Brodovich's early work. And when he moved to the States, um, Carmel Snow, who at the time was editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar magazine, um, said of his work, I saw a fresh new conception of layout techniques that struck me like a revelation. Pages that bled beautifully, cropped photographs, typography, and designs that are bold and arresting. Well, surely that's what we need, whatever the medium, to attract people's attention and then to engage with them. Um, Harper's Bazaar became Brodovich's well, most well-known project, and to keep his designs really fresh, he often commissioned work from European artists, uh, Jean Cocteau, Marc Chagall, Man Ray. Um, and his knowledge of photography was what gave his work its very classical feel. He often cropped photographs in unexpected ways, and he placed them often off-center. Sometimes they'd bleed outside the margins of the page, and he created compositions which are really full of energy and movement. And throughout his career, he used content in photographs and illustrations to inform the placement and the shape of his text. Um, and I find his uh, design process really fascinating, more fascinating than his finished work sometimes, um, because I learn a lot about uh, somebody's work by looking at their work in progress. And he designed by um, dis sketching layouts on paper. Um, and then he arranged those spreads on the floor of the studio to uh, create a well-paced magazine. And that surely is what an online customer journey or user experience is still all about. So, this might first seem like a random um, arrangement of pictures, but they were very deliberately placed, um, and they fill this design with movement, and we can use the same technique today, even when we're designing flexible, responsive layouts. So for this first Brodovich-inspired design, I'm going to scatter these four differently sized images right the way across the viewport. I can arrange them horizontally or vertically or even diagonally depending on the screen dimensions. Um, and to help me create a consistent experience across screen sizes, I often um, make a storyboard um, from a short series of sketches. Um, and then I, turn, I can turn my group of images, for example, um, into a horizontally scrolling panel on small screens, and then on medium-sized screens, I can scatter them vertically, and then to maintain um, hierarchy, scatter them horizontally on larger screens. And to develop this design, all I need is a combination of CSS grid, Flexbox, and some CSS transforms. So this is the markup that I need. You know, it's minimal. It's meaningful. There are only three structural elements um, that I need for layout. And then to implement this layout, I'm actually going to use a, a 4 plus 6 compound grid, the one that I showed you earlier. And then I can place those elements in position on the grid. And then using a media query, when the screen gets wide enough, I can then reposition those images into uh, those elements into a different position on my grid. And then I can nudge and rotate those images to give them this scattered look that 
um, Brodovich inspired. Now, very simple markup, very simple HTML, completely flexible and totally responsive. What's not to like? Now, people have told me that designs like this, you know, they're probably appropriate for editorial, but, you know, they're not appropriate for, um, for products or websites which sell products or promote them. I don't think that's the case at all. Um, I actually used pictures in the same way to bring this design for a new electric um, Vespa to life. Now, Brodovich made this the double page spread in the magazine his real playground. He used this large canvas to construct his compositions. Um, that canvas always reminds me of the big 27 inch IMAX screen that I sit in front of every day. And facing pages allow Brodovich the possibility to contrast or connect both sides of a spread. So this large screen design splits the viewport into two columns. It uses color and shape to reflect one half with the other. And all I need is three structural elements to implement this design. I've got a heading, a main element, and an aside. No presentational HTML whatsoever. And then on smaller screens, all I need are foundation styles. Um, things like foreground and background colors and typography styles because the normal flow will take care of everything else. And then on medium-sized screens, I'm going to apply grid properties to both the main and the aside elements. You can see my grid there, 2, 1, 1, 2. And then I can reposition their content. And for larger screens then, I can place the main and the aside elements onto the grid here. I'm actually using named lines rather than just uh, line numbers. Always useful when you're working in teams and you want to make it more obvious to somebody else which the hell this line actually relates to. And then with a little inspiration and imagination, you know, we can really make more distinctive and engaging designs. Now, I touched on this earlier. Shapes really add movement to a design. They draw people in. They help us to connect an audience with a story, and they make tighter connections between um, the visual and the written content. So inspired by Brodovich, this design, um, I use the shape of the running text here, um, reflects the shape in the header image, which is opposite. And I've seen a few examples of CSS shapes which you know, they hardly ever go beyond just using basic shapes like circles and ellipses. Even polygons don't seem to get used very often. And, you know, this is really disappointing considering how many creative opportunities we can have from using things like CSS shapes. So we can actually use shapes to sculpt um, text from solid blocks um, into these kind of structural shapes in the style of Brodovich to get something like this. And the markup that I need to um, implement this design is really similar to that previous example. I just have a header which contains a picture element and then I've got a main for the running text. You know, this design won't make sense across all different screen sizes, but that's the point. It needn't look or be the same across screen sizes. What matters is we make designs which are appropriate. We shouldn't let the fact that something isn't going to look the same on a small screen stop us from doing something creative on a bigger one. So, for example, Browsers that don't support CSS shapes will just see a regular column of text. Now, it needs very, very little markup to actually implement a design like this. So inside my um, main element here, I've got two SVG images, which I use to um, 
carve that running text out into its shapes. I could insert them with uh, before and after pseudo elements if I decided to. And then for larger screens, what I do is I have a symmetrical two-column grid for the, on the body element, and I put the header image on one side and the main, image, uh, main element on the other using these named lines. Don't worry about uh, any code for this kind of stuff, because everything that, uh, that I'm talking about is actually up on Smashing Magazine. And then what I can do is I can rotate that image by 20 degrees. I can change the transform origin so that it stays in the middle of my header. And then all that remains really is for me to float um, those shape images um, to the left and to the right so that that running text is forced down between them so that it mirrors the shape of that image opposite. You can see that here. And we have some contrast. Maybe my grids need to be pink next time. Pink goes with my eyes. So we've got countless opportunities um, to capture readers' attentions um, using things like CSS shapes, keeping people really engaged and surprised and, and delighted. And I think that's what creative work should be about. Now, when Brodovich became frustrated with commercial uh, constraints working on Harper's Bazaar, um, he started collaborating on a very short-lived magazine called Portfolio, um, and it just had three issues, but he did some stunning work. Um, his aim was to make not just a magazine, but a graphic experience. So he made things like this, flexible designs, which um, we, can, we can implement this kind of stuff online um, using you know, very precisely placed images um, and elements it was really tricky to do previously using things like floats, CSS positioning. But now that we've got modern CSS techniques, we've made these designs much more straightforward. Hopefully, it's going to inspire a whole new generation of, of inspired designs. So this design was inspired by a spread from that second issue of Portfolio. Um, Brodovich used this very striking com uh, combination of black and white columns in this bold splash of color. Um, and then before implementing the design again, I made a simple storyboard which demonstrates how the elements are going to flow across different screen sizes. And then the footer which occupies the right half of the screen needs a little bit more styling. Well, that's never happened to me before. <laughs> Obviously, the talk was going so badly that everybody wanted to leave. I'm not sure who I blame for pushing the fire alarm. I think it might have been Stefan. Could have been Stefan. I think it was all of the Brexit jokes have obviously offended too many people. What was that? Ah, right, okay. So, before I get cracking, so I'm going to cut a little bit off this because of the, uh, the delay. Um, I, was once, uh, I once did a, a conference series called a list of, uh, An Event Apart in, um, in America, and we did the same, same lineup for five different conferences across the U.S. So we, did, we got to the first one, and I had a George Bush joke. And Eric Meyer said, don't do the George Bush joke. Not needed. Not everybody will like the George Bush joke. Okay, so I took the George Bush joke out. My friend Jared Spool got up before me. He did a joke about Dick Cheney and waterboarding. <laughs> At which point Eric said, okay, the Bush joke is back in. We, he, we did the same jokes all the way through the five conferences. Every time they got a laugh. Um, we got to Washington, D.C., and Jared did the Dick Cheney waterboarding gag, and literally 
there was this noise. And it was like... And all of the oxygen was sucked out of the room. (laughs) So now I only make jokes about Brexit. That is my thing. Okay, so I want to talk about this lady here, Bea Feitler. And I've lost my clicker. Now, Feitler was actually born in, in Rio in 1938. She worked on book covers and magazine designs and poster designs in Brazil, and then she moved to Manhattan. And then in 1961, when she was only 25 years old, she became an art assistant and then one of the youngest um, and first female art directors at Harper's Bazaar. And despite her portfolio containing some incredibly iconic work like Richard Avedon's pink space helmet and um, there's a naked John Lennon wrapped around Yoko Ono. She's been described as the pioneering female art director that you've never heard of. And on top of everything, she, uh, she once kissed Andy Warhol, which I suppose today's equivalent would be me kissing Stefan. That might be it. Um, <laughs> it's not going to happen. I'm just going to let you know. I mean, I've never heard Bea Feitler mentioned at any design conference, let alone um, a web conference. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Feitler, which could just as easily apply to the web. Magazines should flow. Um, it should have rhythm. You can't just look at one page alone. You have to visualize what comes before and after. And good editorial design, and I think good web design, is all about creating a harmonic flow. This can be a harmonic flow on a page itself. We talked about rhythm in column design earlier, or across a a storyboarded series of pages. And like Alexei Brodovich, she kind of instinctively understood the double page spread. And her bold designs are only one of the, uh, the things that make her life and her work really fascinating. Um, even more important, I think, are the ways in which her work reflected um, society and its changes in the U.S. in the 1960s. And she made these bold choices um, to influence it. Um, And I think that she's got as much to teach people who design for the web today as magazine designers who then followed her. And I just hope that um, in some small way through talks like this, I can help people fall in love with her work in the way that I did. So let's talk about balancing and visual weight. Um, This is an image uh, photography by, I think, Hero um, from an edition of... uh, of Harper's Bazaar in the 1960s. And uh, Feitler actually regularly combined photographs with illustrations and sometimes even comic book art. Um, For Harper's Bazaar, she actually on the left here placed one of uh, Avedon's photographs um, of Gene Shrimpton here wearing a space helmet um, onto this comic book background. And for some reason, this, this image was, was just not working for her. The photograph on its own wasn't working for her. So she rushed down into the street in Manhattan, um, bought a comic that had like a space theme, cut out the picture and superimposed it on the back. Um, and then in 1973, she actually commissioned a, a legendary uh, female comic artist called Marie Severin to create this cover for Ms. magazine. So for my design, I want to bring a little bit of that influence um, from Bea Feitler. And to accomplish something like this, um, I just need the most minimal set of structural elements that I can. Just a header element, a main, and an aside. That's all I need. Nothing presentational. Now, here's the thing. We talked about this earlier where... um, This portrait format image works really well on taller screens. But 
we need to sometimes think about using different images for different orientations. So we probably need a wider image when screens are wider than they are tall, i.e. landscape. And this media query here can be used in style sheets and it can also be used as an alternative um, to more conventional um, width queries um, on things like the picture element. So in landscape orientation, I can just add two symmetrical columns and I've got a linear gradient which fills the full height of the background of the screen and then the result is one which adapts its layout um, depending on whether a person has a browser or a device that's in landscape or in portrait orientation. We talked about scale earlier. I'm going to leave the hideous babies behind and talk about Volkswagen Beetles again. So the Beetle was a really small car back in the day. Um, had a really big personality. So for this example, what I want to do is I want to have uh, a design that has a personality to match. And here, this kind of contrast of scale, something we know to be big, small in the background, something we know to be smaller, like legs, closer and in the foreground. So this large screen design uh, includes this enormous picture of the beetle's wheel, and that emphasizes the smallness of the little car. And then all I need is three structural elements uh, to implement the design. Um, a header for that large wheel picture, um, a figure which contains the, the smaller image of the car, and then a main element for the running text. Now before I get to the large screen, I need to make sure that I maintain that contrast in scale, even on the smallest screens. But one problem that we'll often encounter when we're using flexible um, layouts is this kind of unintentional resizing of images. So, you know, if I've got a fixed height on my header element, but then um, a max width of 100% on the image, um, what I'm going to get is this distorted um, giant wheel. It looks like I've given this uh, beetle a flat tire. And fortunately, there is a way that we can preserve the aspect ratio of these images now using uh, what's called the object fit property in CSS. Um, two that I'll mention here, contain preserves the aspect ratio of an image and um, it fits it inside its parent box, so it's kind of contained inside the, uh, the header. Or cover, which basically still preserves the aspect ratio, but this time it fills the whole box and parts of the image are going to get cut off. So it's covering the element. And then this alternative design, I can preserve that difference in scale between both pictures across a whole range of screen sizes using CSS Grid. Now, Feitler was also famous for making very bold, vibrant, and confident color choices. Um, this was one of the hallmarks of her work. It really attracted me immediately. Um, so for this next design, I want to contrast this deep red with this vibrant yellow and then reverse those colors out on both sides of the design. So it's big on color. It's really, really small still on HTML. It has just two structural elements, a figure and a division, sorry, a header and a main, and inside each one we have a figure and a division which holds the content. And then for medium-sized screens, I just want those figures and those divisions inside the header and the main elements to occupy half the width, um, half the height of the viewport and, and the whole width. So I've got this symmetrical two-column grid and then a minimum height of 50% or, or 50 VH and then I can place those elements on the grid. And then on larger screens, I can apply this symmetrical two-column grid to the entire page, which extends that full height to the body element. And then I can just reposition those elements using CSS Grid within a media query. Very simple 
once you get your head around CSS Grid, which is not difficult to learn. And I just think she's got so much to teach people um, about web design today. Sadly, um, there's only one book, there's only been one exhibition about Feitler's work. This one book was published in 2012 um, in Brazil in Portuguese. Um, it took me months to track down a copy. Um, and in the end, I did. It's the most expensive book I've ever bought <laughs> at about 250 euro. So, but worth it. It was worth every penny for the motivation and the inspiration and getting me excited about design again. So let's just talk about patterns and texture. This is a, a later spread from Vanity Fair. Um, my design uses blend modes and clip paths and, C and SVG patterns. Um, and I want to convey the kind of the curvaceousness of the beetle using circles. And again, I just need very, very minimal HTML. I've just got three elements there. I've got a header and a main and an aside. And then I've got these half-tone dots which add texture to the page. And it's really easy to implement patterns like this um, using multiple background gradients in CSS and then use a combination of background size and background position. Zoom in to see that detail. Now, Leia Veru um, has been compiling for years this kind of gallery of really useful CSS uh, patterns using linear and radial gradients. Um, as clever as those things are, there's just something about using complicated gradients to make patterns like this that just bothers me. Doesn't seem like the right job for CSS. Um, I think SVG would be the perfect thing. So here what I've done is I've made the, the backgrounds of, uh, of these elements properly transparent. Um, I can change the background of those parent divisions whenever I need to. Um, and then I can add slightly transparent background colors, which kind of hint at that dot pattern that shows through. And we end up with a result that's got, you know, depth and a little bit of texture. And, you know, without going kind of um, fully skeuomorphic, it does just kind of give designs a little bit more interest than the very dry, tedious, kind of flat design aesthetic that we've been suffering from for the last five years or so. Now, with so much kind of texture in the design, um, I need the layout to be really simple, so I've just got a, a symmetrical, uh, sorry, an asymmetrical grid. Uh, the narrowest column can never shrink below 260 pixels um, using that min-max property. And then in, to, include, uh, to improve a little bit of accessibility and readability on the text against that red pattern, um, I'm going to add a, a subtle shadow in the same color as the background. And then in the past, if I was going to apply a blur um, or a con color change or a drop shadow or anything like that, I'd need to add destructive effects to a, an image using a, an editor like Photoshop. But we've got so many of those filters that are now available in CSS, and we can apply CSS filters to images, but also to other HTML elements too. So I'm not advocating that we return to the kind of worst excesses of skeuomorphism. I think that we've all remember, um, was it Game Center on iOS that used that kind of gray, uh, green felt background? All those kind of very, we've moved beyond skeuomorphism. But I really, really hope that product and website designers realize the value of um, a more vibrant approach to design, um, which really maybe helps to um, distinguish a brand from um, its competitors 
and it also uses things like gradients and patterns and shadows to not only tell a, a story, but also to provide greater affordance, which is one of the things that I think has really suffered with this kind of flat design trend. So, there's so much that we can learn and be inspired by um, from other media. I don't buy this argument that, um, you know, the web isn't print, therefore we can't really look to print or other media for inspiration. What it takes is imagination. It takes being curious. It takes collecting things, collecting inspiration, collecting inputs, and then looking at something and going, that's cool. I wonder whether I could turn that into a thing, whatever that thing may be. So I really hope that um, you know, my motivation being back um, helps me to get other people um, excited about um, more creative design for the web again. And that's, uh, that's what this book is all about. I do have a free copy which I can send to somebody um, who is, oh no, you've already got your Motorhead t-shirt. Ah, oh, no other, nobody slipped up to the hotel room and, and got another Motorhead t-shirt on <laughs> during the break. That's very disappointing. Somebody asked me whether Metallica, um, yes, it was you, asked whether, whether Metallica was good enough. No. <laughs> Metallica are rubbish. Um, like I said, you can get the, um, get the video course 50% off with the code ACE of SPADES and Vielen Dank.